Now the first thing I need to get across before I start this is I need people to understand I haven't read everything in the EU, the original EU. I have read a lot. I haven't read the X-Wing books. I have not read The Fate of the Jedi. But I feel like I've read enough that I can talk about it and not feel like a damn fool. But Star Wars fans are always able to show me that I will always be a fool on some things. And that's fine. That's fine. I just want to kind of get out there. Guys, I've read a ton of EU books, but I haven't read them all. So if I leave yours off, trust me, it's not a slight. I just might not have read it yet. So I want to get that out there before we talked about my 10 favorite Star Wars books. Let's do it. You know, a great Jedi Master once said, always two there are. Well, not for this list. There can only be one. Let's talk about it. Yep. I am forever 12 years old, guys. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to Sci-Fi September. We're going to talk a little Star Wars today. And yes, guys, I do consider Star Wars science fiction. You can put your fantasy, you can put all that stuff in it. Look, it's got spaceships, it's got interstellar travel, things like that. I'm going with sci-fi. Always have. But it doesn't matter. Anyone can love Star Wars no matter what genre you think it is. Now, look, this is just going to be a top 10 of my favorite expanded universe novels. And notice I'm not saying legends, guys, because no, I do not consider this uh, alternate history. This will always be history to me. Now, look, if you love what Disney is doing, if you love what they're doing with their books and stuff, that's fine. You're allowed to do that just like I'm allowed to do this. But again, that's just where I'm coming from. If you want my opinions on that, I have talked in depth about why I love the Expanded Universe and why it will always be canon to me. But I want to say, look, guys, if I'm missing your favorite, it's just likely that I haven't read it. And also, look, this is a list that uh, after I upload this, probably five minutes later, I'll have changed my opinion. So I haven't read a lot of these series that you guys are looking at, but 55. I have read 55 Expanded Universe novels. That doesn't include like movie novelizations or comic books or anything. Just 55 regular novels. I haven't read the X-Wing novels and I never read Fate of the Jedi, which I've already talked about on this channel before. I'm not going to regurgitate that. But yes, these are my 10 favorite. Gun to my head right now. And uh, we're just going to kind of get right into it. And we're going to begin with number 10, guys. No honorable mentions in this one. It's just number 10. This is Vector Prime by R.A. Salvatore. Now, look, with this one, I think it's not... The story is 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 good. It's not what I say one is one of the 10 best uh, expanded universe stories. We're just going to call it the EU from now on. It's, it's just it, what this it did was something at the time is I felt like Star Wars was maybe this is this whole uh, EU thing was starting to get a little long in the tooth. It was starting to repeat a lot of the same stories. And I was like, I was getting kind of tired of watching uh, our, our, our heroes kind of Cobra Commander, the, uh, the Empire. I needed something new. So not only did we get new villains in this, but I felt like, you know, we got a little bit of darkness because with this, we got uh, not a retread at all. And we got new villains that were very, very intimidating, very different from the Empire, and very much a threat to the entire galaxy. And you can see why right off the bat with the Yuzon Vong that we had had. Okay, this is something different than, uh, than our heroes have ever faced before. And yeah, these guys seem like they're serious. And they're very serious right from the go. Because I think that what this did with the new Jedi Order was it showed things are going to be different now, guys. Um, we're not, we're not, this is a playtime anymore. It's just serious. Anyone is disposable. Even legacy characters can die now. And it really showed, okay, they're serious about this. Now, look, when I read this book, yeah, I was, I was a mess <laughs> for reasons that if you've read it, you know, I, I even though it's like that many years ago, I'm not going to spoil it, guys. I just, I want people still to read these things so I don't spoil them. But it's just, uh, yeah, like I said, it was just kind of felt like a dawning of a new age of Star Wars because it felt like, hey, the Star Wars is growing up because we know all of its fans are growing up. How about we matured up a little bit? And I don't ever think it really gets like, you know, hopeless or anything like that. This is like grimdark science fiction. But uh, yeah, there are some ser serious, serious stakes that there weren't before. Number nine, I, Jedi by Michael Stackpole. I think he, uh, did he, wrote, I believe he wrote some more uh, X-Wing stories in this. 
which makes sense because uh, Coran Horn, I believe, did debut in those X-Wing books. I might be wrong on all this. I, like I said, I haven't read the X-Wing series, guys. Uh, look, I liked the Jedi Academy trilogy. I know everybody loves their shit on Kevin J. Anderson. And as a fan of Dune, I am right there with you uh, on what they've done to that franchise. But um, I, I really did like the Jedi Academy books when I read them. Now, I do want to kind of get out in front of this, guys. I haven't read some of these in 15 to 20 years. Okay, so a lot of this is going off of memory, going off of nostalgia. I know some of these things. Most likely, like what I've heard about the Jedi Academy trilogy lately, is, yeah, it's YA. It's something that if you go back and you read it now as an adult, it might be a little bit of a tougher read for you. But at the time, I really liked it because it gave us, you know, these new heroes to kind of root for and watch these this next generation kind of grow up. It was really, really good. But this is about I Jedi. What I Jedi did was, while I liked the Jedi Academy trilogy, this made it better in hindsight because it played into that. Now, I know that there have been some arguments that this really did make some continuity errors. And look, guys... I'm not going to lie to you. There's continuity errors all over this timeline. It does happen sometimes. So we're not like talking like Fox's X-Men level of continuity errors, but there might be some things you're like, huh, yeah, maybe we kind of goofed that up or we just kind of wanted to disregard it. And if you believe the rumors going on right now, they kind of want to disregard other things in the Star Wars universe. But with this one, like I said, this was my introduction to Cranhorn Horn because uh, I did not read those X-Wing books and, and I love him. Look, he's a fan favorite, I think. What I think what most people liked about him is he wasn't afraid to speak out. At the time, it was like anyone in the Academy, whatever Luke said, that was gospel. It went, well, Luke's the best. He he knows what's right. He was one of the first that would actually speak up if he thought Luke was wrong. And it was never in like a bratty kind of way, like, I could do this better than you. You know, it was never nothing like that. It's just he thought if, if Luke was wrong on something he was going to address it. And he was going to talk about it. And I think a lot of people kind of respected that. And Luke respected him for that, you know. He would uh, he would call him out on things and make him you know double think some things. I always really did appreciate that. Seeing his uh, seeing his uh, ascent into uh, being a Jedi was really really great. Really really good one off. I think. Let's go to number eight here. This is the Hut Gambit by A. C. Crispin. You guys know that A. C. Crispin was a lady. It, it still is honestly. But uh, the thing was is like I remember at the time this was like a big secret. I actually met her at a book signing, so I wasn't stunned. I don't think when I was there I was stunned. Or anything like that. It's just I understood at the time, uh, female science fiction writers weren't getting a lot of attention, and Star Wars very much was a dude thing. I think in the general consensus, so she had to use the name A. C. Crispin, so people would buy her books. Well, I bought her books and I read them and I loved them and I would have even if I'd known it was a female author. But I know not everybody did. I don't know why I'm going on this long about it, but I just I don't know. That was a fun story that I actually did meet her. But look, this is the book that I think Solo, a Star Wars story, should have adapted. Now, it pulled things from it. It did pull things from it. It just didn't do it as well. Uh, I think this is the perfect coming-of-age tale for young Han Solo. Uh, the first book in the series was a Paradise Snare, I think, or... I don't know. I can't remember if that's the first or the third one. But the Hut game was always the one that stuck out with me. This is your first adventures, really, of Han and Chewie and Lando. You know, your scoundrels. You really get to kind of see that connection. You get to see about Chewbacca's life debt that we've wondered about forever. You get to hear about the Kessel Run. The Kessel Run is always the one that has just mystified us since we first saw A New Hope years and years and years ago. But, uh, yeah, just the early history of Han and Boba Fett. And, of course, the Hut is why this one always kind of sticks out with me. Again, another one that might be a little, a little YA when you're looking at it now. But at the time, that's kind of how I felt about it. You know, I just realized I was so anxious to show you guys that lightsaber that I forgot I have these books sitting here to, to, to show you guys with each one. It's really crazy. So let's do that now. Vector Prime. And guys, if you'll notice, the first thing about these here is uh, there's no there's no Legends, Mark, because a lot of these are, all these are the ones that I, I read brand new when they came out. That's why a lot of them look kind of beat up here. I Jedi as well. Some of the other ones get really, really rough because I started loaning them out to friends when I was in high school because I wanted somebody to read that. And, of course, The Hut Gambit. Now, let's move along here back to, uh, what were we, number seven here. We got The Enemy Lines Duology. And I know you're like, that is cheating, sir. You're putting two books into one thing here. And I want to say I'm making an exception for this. Don't worry, I'm not going to be putting like the Thrawn trilogy or the, you know, the the the, the hand of Thrawn or something. I'm not going to be putting none of that stuff as one. This is the only case I'm going to kind of do that. And I think because the reason it was is Aaron Alston, the one who wrote this, I think the story just kind of got away from him a little bit. And, and here's the thing: Star by Star came out, I believe, a, a year before that, and it kind of spooked some people because the thing was is these Star Wars books were short. I mean, they were 300 pages, usually max. You could blow through them really, really quick. And then Star by Star came out and it was 600 plus pages and it kind of freaked people out. And they're like, okay, 
is this series kind of starting to do that where it's just going to start being like uh, them, some of them fantasy bricks that we see on, on the bookshelves. Uh, so I think that what happened there is the story got away from them a little bit and they tried editing it down. It couldn't happen. So they said, okay, well, we're not putting out a 650 page book. So we'll just put these out. Uh, if I recall, they either came out either at the same time or like a month apart. I remember not having to wait very long for those two. So I didn't mind. But again, I feel like that was a story that really was counted as one. Uh, it felt like the first real, you know, where the, the rebellion kind of strikes back kind of thing after the events that happened in Star by Star. And it took the story back to its rebellion roots. I like that quite a bit because I felt like it got to the point where Okay, yeah, the, the Yuuzhan Vong are serious. They're not like the Empire, like I said. They're not in the Cobra commandering all the time. It started to feel like, yeah, but they were always trying to. They were always always finding a way to come out over over uh, over the uh, the Yuuzhan Vong in every instance here. But with uh with this with this after Star by Star, where you see that's not quite the case. Uh, this kind of felt like we were going back to the roots of Star Wars, going back to a rebellion story, and I like that very much. And I liked very much that. Again, I know I keep beating this drum because I just I know people are going to be saying it in the comments. I haven't read the X Wing book, so it was good to see a story story based really around Wedge. Wedge was very much the driving force in that duology there. And I think the book was better for it. Number six is going to be kind of controversial to some people because when I did do a review of Shadows of the Empire, a lot of people hate it. Uh, here's the thing for me. We always argued as kids about what took place between the Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Why is Luke like on his deathbed basically with one arm and all of a sudden in the next movie, this dude is a full-on ninja assassin badass of a Jedi Knight. We always wonder what in the world happened during this time. Well, you get the answers in Shadows of the Empire. Uh, I, again, read it so long ago, I don't know how well some of these things hold up, but at the time, I thought it was brilliant. You saw that you get to see more Vader. That was the coolest thing, getting to see more Vader because he obviously was still alive on this at this part of the timeline. But um, see that he maybe he had lost some favor with the Emperor, and the Emperor was thinking about replacing him. And then you get the introduction, the introduction of Dash Rendar, uh, basically uh, the Han Solo replacement, and he replaces him pretty good. It's pretty good if, if Harrison Ford played. Han Solo, kind of imagine like Kurt Russell playing Dash Rendar, which can kind of be like your poor man's Han Solo, right? But done very, very well. Uh, I think Dash is a, a fan favorite for a reason. And his ship, the Outrider, is just awesome. But I love how Luke, like I said, it gets to show how Luke goes from being, you know, still learning to basically becoming a Jedi Knight over the stretch and with this extra adventure here that very much could have been enough to make a movie out of, I think. Uh, but, you know, these things are always fun in hindsight. But uh, I, I think it's it's good and great for just those reasons. Now let's get into the, the top five here. And this is going to be uh, book three of the Thrawn trilogy. This is the last command. I think that is a mostly satisfying conclusion to the Thrawn trilogy. I, I still consider this, like I said, guys, the true sequel trilogy. Uh, th this, is, this would be episode nine, you would say. And I think after the episode nine we got, most would be okay with that. Here's the deal. Uh, I think that you get to see a lot of questions answered in that one. You know, as kids, we used to argue who would win in a fight between this and this. You'd be like, well, you're an idiot. They're on the same side. Why would they fight? Well, you get to see answers to questions like that because of reasons in this book. And it's done so, so well. And I love it. It really is just a really kick-ass moment, I think. And then you get to see the arrival of Jason and Jaina in this. The characters are going to be a very, very big part of the EU going forward. Getting to see their arrival after, you know, kind of teasing it in the first couple of books. Getting to see that. And again, guys, this just has one of the best uh, third act climaxes in all of the EU. There's like three separate plot lines are going on and they are all just phenomenal. And they're done perfectly well. I think that Timothy Zahn, I think besides maybe Dave Filoni and George Lucas, no one understands what makes Star Wars go more than Timothy Zahn. And I, I just, I mean, I was so, so pleasantly surprised with this trilogy when it came out because uh, I'll talk about it a little further down this list, but I mean, Star Wars was basically almost like a dead property at the time. People can't imagine that, but it was. It was kind of starting to fade into obscurity. But I'll talk about that in a minute. But anytime you can get more Grand Admiral Thrawn, you're probably going to have a good chance of making this list. Uh, number four, I got them ordered wrong here. Dang it. <laughs> number four, this is the unifying force. The end, the conclusion uh, next, yeah, the conclusion of the New Jedi Order, and I've talked numerous times about why I love the New Jedi Order and why I think that you should read it. And with this book, I have, I mean, just following the, NJ, the NJO for years, and this ending, at the book 19, was it 17 or 19? I can never remember that, because uh, I think there's some ebooks or something. That's why I always get that mixed up. But the end of this really 
felt like the true ending for me. Uh, I, and now I know Legacy of the Forest came after this, and obviously Fate of the Jedi, which I've yet to read. But with me, this is kind of like that feeling where you're with a group of friends and you realize this is the last time we're all going to be in the same room together. This is the last time we're all going to share these moments. That's how it really felt to me. It really felt like the true goodbye to our our heroes that we've followed for all these years, you know? So with me, like I said, this is one of the few Star Wars books that ever bring me to tears, but these last pages were just so good. And, and Anakin Solo's lightsaber that they do with Tartan, they have in this, oh, still cuts me just thinking about it. But man, I just, I love the new Jedi Order so much. And I know it's just such a divisive series within the EU, but man, it just... It took everything I love about what they've been doing and it just kind of, like I said, it made it, it, it grew with my age here in a way that I just loved. It was perfect timing, I think, for me. And that brings me to probably the darkest one on this list. This is number three. This is Star by Star by Troy Denning. Uh, this book, man, this is the most grim and most shocking EU book ever, I, I think, because there's so many times where you're like, well, how are they going to get out of this one? You know, you always have that kind of attitude of, you know, how are heroes going to get out of this one? And you find out this one, they don't. They're not going to get out of it. And it's like, oh my God, you know? And it, it I don't want to say it felt hopeless, but it was the first time we were like, wow, they, they might lose this thing, like for real. I mean, you came close. You kind of felt like that. Hey, Thrawn's got a chance to win this, but you never really truly believed that. With this, you didn't want to believe it, but you had the kind of inkling feeling over here. Yeah. They could be a deep shit here, and they were. They were, and just the ending is an all timer. And it just I, look the the length of this when it came out was a holy shit. Look at for me, it was like okay, cool. Uh, it's two books, great. I don't have to wait because at the time, guys, they were pumping these out about every three months. They were pumping these out. But I was like, cool, I get two books up front. Why not? I was so invested in the, in the NJO at the time. But uh, this was kind of a breaking point, I think, for a lot of EU readers. There were a lot who did not read star wars for you know dark stuff or grim stuff or the feelings of hopelessness sometimes uh, i think my my grim dark roots were kind of starting at this point this age and so i was i was loving it i was loving where it was going yeah it was shocking it was real there was characters dying there were you know bad things happening but i was here for it i was like i need to know that the enemy is still a threat that everything's not going to be okay and i think this was the book that really did it and i and i, I give props to denning for having the the balls to do this but look it's not all dark. I mean, uh, Han and Leia kind of rebuild their friendship, or the sorry, the romance, the relationship. Uh, they had kind of been on the ropes a little bit, and then you had uh, what Luke and R two going back to like their dog fighting days in the X wing. That was a lot of fun, and uh, the the Vergeer, the Vergeer plot line starts to actually make some sense. Character had been revealed a few books before, and it didn't really. It was like, what what is going on here? They really planted those seeds a little earlier than people remember, I think, and that was where you first started to get some real answers about what was going on but look it's a it's an amazing book and it would probably be number two if it worked for certain things that happened with vergeer and i gotta talk about that with number two which is traitor vergeer in this man it all comes to a head in traitor this one is by matthew stover and look i like this book so much guys i bought matthew stover's um god what's it called the hero acts of cain series just because, i haven't read it yet but i bought it just because of how much i liked this book it is so good so close to being my favorite out of all these here, but if Star by Star was shocking with its ending, this one was just kind of a heart punch. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I try not to spoil these things. Like you get everything from an uprising to uh, just like incredible manipulation and torture. And of course, a heroic last stand for a beloved character, I think is very much your Gandalf, you shall not pass moment in this. And it's, it's so good. It's such an incredible moment, cinematic in a way that you could just see if this was something that people in the theaters would have either just been standing up and cheering or just tears running down their faces it's just so so good and it was so earned it's just this is just a part of my language is a mind fuck more than any other book on this list you know i remember when i first started i was thinking this would come oh man it's gonna be like a kind of a philosophical book no no this really is very much an important book as important of a book as anything in the new jedi order and the best i think that the new jedi order had to offer it would be number one in the eu if not for mr zion and the heir to the empire i know big shocker that i was going to pick this one right look guys like i said this is the book that brought star wars back from the dead some people might be like what are you talking about look 
I was there. I remember, guys. It was nothing going on with Star Wars. Uh, Turn of the Jedi came out in 83. This didn't come out until 1991. And it was people were starting to forget about it. It really was. They, they, they had like a VHS release, I think, in the mid to late 80s. And then you didn't hear nothing about Star Wars for a few years. You heard rumors that George Lucas was interested in doing more, but he wanted to work on other projects. You know, he was doing Willow and things like that. He was doing other stuff. He had walked away from Star Wars. It was done. So people had kind of started to forget about it. And look, Alan Dean Foster may have technically started the EU with uh, Splendor of the Mind's Eye, but uh, Timothy Zahn revived it. He brought it back from the dead. And it was just like, wow. It was such a big deal when it happened. I remember going to the bookstore to pick up Air of the Empire. And in the bookstore, yes, we did go to bookstores back then, guys. It was, it was actually, um, it was Walden Books. You guys remember Walden Books? But we went in there and they were playing like the Star Wars music. There was a guy dressed up like Boba Fett, a guy dressed up like Darth Vader, and a guy dressed up like a stormtrooper, like professional, like the real ones, not like fans. And they were there just kind of like standing there for, for the, at the cash register for them to sell this. This is how big a deal this was. It really was. I mean, because it was officially labeled as canon, and it still is. And it was just such a big, big moment, I think, for Star Wars was back. You know, it really felt, okay, we're never going to get any more movies, clearly. That's what we thought in 1991. But hey, Star Wars can live on. And seeing where our heroes were five years after Return of the Jedi just made everything great. I love about the book just showing that the Empire was very much a threat still, regardless of what happened to Vader and the Emperor in Return of the Jedi. We still had a very, very major conflict on our hands, and they were very much still a player. And it, ar it arguably introduced the most popular EU villain of all time in Grand Admiral Thrawn. And right away, I mean, the first chapter with this guy, and you see okay, this is different. Now, this guy could have very easily, let's just make a Darth Vader clone and roll with it and see what happens. No, it made him very, very different. Very, very different, but so special and unique and memorable. And that's why people still carry on about it. That's why they're trying to pull him into uh, what the Disney canon now, uh, I, mean, I guess they already have. I mean, Timothy Zahn has wrote some books in the new canon, uh, but now they're supposed to be bringing him onto the Mandalorian. So we're going to see a live action Grand Admiral Thrawn for the first time. I'm just hoping that they still use uh, Thrawn in this is the blueprint because the Thrawn that was in Rebels didn't feel like the same character to me and neither did the Thrawn in the uh, in the new Timothy Zahn trilogy because I just felt like, okay, take this really awesome character that you wrote, you know, 30 years ago, but uh, make sure you stick around like our new canon. I felt like they just kind of really just, you know, defanged the character to a point to where it was just like, man, it just feels kind of forced now because it's kind of wedged in there. Uh, so uh, with this, guys, you don't have any of that problem. It is done organically. It is done well. And it just, like I said, it shows our heroes where they are five years later, seeing that Luke still has many a thing to learn. You know, he's not the all-knowing Jedi Master. Now that he doesn't have an Obi-Wan or Yoda to learn from anymore, where does he go from here? And it really does show that he still has a ways to go. This isn't like the new movies, guys. You aren't a Jedi Knight in five minutes. You really still have a lot of learning to do. So I would argue, you never stop learning. But so many great moments. It never felt forced or cheap. Like I said, he could have relied on just the greatest hits. He could have done a lot of wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Hey, remember when this happened in those movies you love so much? And he introduced one of the most popular characters ever in Mara Jade. It's just so well done, guys. I revisited this two years ago, and I loved it every bit as much. And look, guys, it just felt like Star Wars. And that's what I wanted in 1991. I wanted to remember, hey, I still watch these movies about once a year, but this is when it moved back up to like, hey, I'm going to watch this trilogy about once a quarter, you know? So, so it really did revitalize my love for Star Wars and I think a lot of others too. And it opened up this whole new world. And that's why I will always hold Heir to the Empire very, very special to me. And again, it is definitely the source material that Disney should have used. Now, look, guys, I had planned on doing a full EU reread when I started doing that, but then I started this channel and uh, things obviously, you know, it, my schedule changed a lot. So I only got to do just the Thrawn trilogy. I was starting there. I was going to redo them all. I was going to do the X-Wing books this time and things like that. And, and I certainly want to read Fate of the Jedi in the X-Wing series. I just don't know when that stuff's going to happen. So I'm definitely not going to be doing a full reread uh, again, at least not right now. But uh, the way I look at it is, look, I'm never going to be done reading stuff, so I can always go back and visit. But right now, there's just so much new stuff I want to read. So I, I don't know if I'd be doing a whole reread of this, but I, I will be dipping into, you know, Fate of the Jedi and, of course, uh, the uh, the X-Wing books. I just, I got to get some of those. I don't have any of those. I have Fate of the Jedi, but I've never gotten any of the X-Wing books. I don't know why. Uh, when it came out, it's just like, I don't know. It just doesn't sound like something interesting to me, even though my friends who are still all in on the EU were saying, these are so great. They're so great. And like I said, 
I know the comments are going to be, you got to read the X-Wing book. So I, I know that this is uh, something that's going to come up quite a bit. But guys, those were my 10 favorite. And like I said, they could change as soon as I upload this. But uh, I'm always more interested in hearing about what your 10 favorite would be as far as why mine suck. But, you know, I do know that this is the Internet. These things are going to happen. So fire at will, Commander. So drop in the comments, guys, and let me know what you think. And I will talk with you there. May the Force be with you.